closure and i'm going to focus on infants and uh, the technical issues relating to cardiac catheterization i was asked to talk about surgical management that essentially is anybody who's not a ca catheter closure candidate who has a large pda would be a surgical candidate there's not too much to it but much of it is really in selecting your cases for surgery so i'm going to talk about essentially anatomy patient characteristics hardware and procedure but i think the the real essence is going to be in knowing whether you can take this patient to the cath lab and close the pda up front or not not taking the patient to the cath lab and then figuring saying that oh i can't do this and actually subjecting the patient to a fair bit of trauma so you got to have this decision made in the echo room and uh, in our own experience of about 4000 pda closures in the cath lab we probably had four or five situations there we gone to the cath lab and then said we can't do this and sent it to theater but the vast majority were able to actually make a very accurate assessment on our ability to close the pda so essentially defining the anatomy by echo is everything and knowing who can be closed in the cath lab and this is a view that not everybody does uh, frequently enough but i would say now it's become common place which is the ductal view i'm going to show you the ductal view is a picture of the heart and you put your transducer here you have the pointer of the transducer point superiorly and then essentially you're looking like at the whole set of structures in a sagittal plane and you make a cut in this fashion so you're looking at everything in sagittal and you make a cut in this fashion and you get essentially this picture um the picture which you get is a very accurate rendition of what you see by angiography or any other means and actually in many ways lets you decide everything right there it decides the size of the duct the anatomy and i'll show you all the details so this picture you can see in the ductal view in the first intercostal space with the pointer pointing at 12 o'clock shows you anteriorly main pulmonary artery the descending aorta and the ampulla of the duct and you need minor adjustments to make sure you get that whole thing very correctly and then you see the pulmonary artery insertion of the duct you can make a magnification and measure it really accurately and by all means you, this allows you to make a decision on what will be the modality of closure what will be the device that is used what is the size of the device whether you can close this in the cath lab or not all the details emerge from this particular echocardiographic frame this color picture actually shows you the flow reversal in the descending thoracic aorta that helps understand how pdas work and you can see how in the diastolic frame the entire blood is going backwards through the pda this is the flow in the aorta uh, in the transverse arch and the proximal aorta uh, isthmic area and this is the descending aortic flow the next frames show you the correlation between the angiogram and echocardiogram and you can get very accurate pictures the same patient whose pda was closed in the cath lab but we obtained nice these beautiful pictures on the echo machine showing you the ampulla the size of the duct at the pulmonary artery insertion and the same picture was obtained through angiography this in this this was the era in which we used to close ducts with coils and it was terribly important to define the ampulla the accurate size of the duct and everything has been done and you can see that the pictures are almost identical uh, so i mean i know that the echo pictures were a little smaller than what uh, i have would have liked to show but let me tell you the ones who are familiar with doing echo would have figured it out now these are angiograms and the angiograms are obtained in two views okay on the left we have a lateral view which tells you the picture the defines the ampulla in many instances and shows the narrowest end of the duct on the right we have an rao view which is essential in many many circumstances that i will explain especially if there is an overlap between the ampulla and the uh, aorta so in this particular instance of course the ampullas are relatively shallow and you are able to see them both in similar ways in both the uh, views but in situations where the ampulla is not very well defined uh, in one view you may see it very well in the other view 
I don't actually believe in this Kuchenko's classification. I don't think there are six types. I think there are as many types as there are patients. And every duct is individual and you have to look at the duct, understand the anatomy and tailor your treatment based on that rather than make it A, B, C, D, E, F. So you can have infinite varieties. Uh, I'm just showing you nine, eight varieties here. And you can have ma many more varieties of PDA sizes. Here is a shallow ampulla, a really sh shallow ampulla, another example of a shallow ampulla, but believe me, I coiled all these ducts when devices were not available. This is also a, a reasonable ampulla, and then the ampulla goes on increasing in size until in the final frame, H, you have a long tubular duct, which can be very challenging to close in the cat lab. But now with the occlusive devices and vascular plugs, we are able to close these as well. So you just essentially have as many varieties as there are patients. And also another important thing to recognize is that the ampulla, this is the aorta, this is the ampulla. The ampulla may arise from the anterior aspect of the aorta and on the leftward aspect of the aorta. Now, when it's overlapping the aorta, this particular duct is seen best in the RAO view and not so much in the lateral view. In the lateral view, you'll think that there is no ampulla. But if you go RAO, you'll see a nice ampulla and you, it, it, this, the, all this matters uh, when you go down to really tiny babies where the uh, aortic retention disc will stick out into the aorta. And if you have made an accurate assessment of the ampulla, then you know. And these are various shapes of ducts which you are seeing. This last one, K, is particularly difficult because the aortic end is narrower than the PA end. It's exceptionally rare. But nowadays, we close pretty much everything except in very specific circumstances. So this is essentially to show you in the suprasternal view how you can determine the ampullary the anatomy in this particular fashion. And then when you've made this assessment, you have to kind of imagine how your device or coil or whatever is going to sit, and you really can plan your strategy. So this is an example of a small infant with a large duct. And it's important to understand how your retention disc is going to sit and imagine that correctly. And if you are not sure, send this patient to surgery, particularly if the child is really tiny preterm, then it's going to be very risky to have a disc sit out and then you can't put this child through a procedure in the cath lab and then say, I can't do this and uh, subject the child to an unnecessary amount of trauma. So here is an example of a nice duct which has got a good ampulla that we can close with coils. I'm going to show you the sequence. This is a lateral angiogram. Notice that we don't have an aortic catheter. What we have is a long sheet that sits in the descending aorta, a wire that goes through the sheath. We have not punctured the artery, and we inject the side arm of the sheath, and this profiles the duct very well. We never obtain arterial access for closure of PDA unless it's a very old patient whose windows are not good. We have not done this for the last three or 4,000 ducts, and we have not regretted it. There are very exceptional circumstances where we have to take an arterial puncture, and it's really not necessary. Um, so this is essentially how you take your first picture and then you define the narrowest end of the duct. You measure this if you wish, but you've already got that measurement in echo. You can visualize the ampulla and you can plan your coils. In this case, I used coils because it's, it was that, that was what was available and you had a coil mass that is attached to a bioptome, which is taking two coils and these two coils are advanced with the help of the bioptome all the way down into the descending thoracic aorta. I'm going to let you let this play. It takes a little while to play here. So you can see that this goes down. I'm sorry, not playing fully. These videos are not essentially playing the way I would like them to play, but yeah, there you go. So this coil mass is brought out into the descending thoracic aorta. And then from there on, it's uh, the catheter is pulled up. You can see that the coil is oscillating in the descending thoracic aorta and the catheter, uh, the long sheath and the bioptome is just pulled up till this coil mass comes in close proximity with the uh, ampulla. Then you have to very carefully see how this works. So just give me a second. These videos have not, are very old videos, so they will take a little while to play. Okay, you can see the subtle oscillation of these coils, but once this coil mass gets into the ampulla, 
the oil oscillation would stop. And then you know for sure that it is well into the ampulla, and then you're kind of ready to release the coils once you've got a very firm position. You can confirm the position with the sidearm injection, and you can see that I've held this very firmly. The coils are not oscillating. Have, the whole coil mass is compact in front of the trachea. I'm ready to release the coils. And once it's released, uh, you can see that the coil mass is very well compacted within the ampulla, and you can release. And this is the technique that allowed us to close several thousand ducts at a very low cost until occlusive devices became affordable. Now we use occlusive devices, and, and there are some many instances where you have to use occlusive devices because there is no ampulla. Here is an example of a duct with very shallow ampulla. You can't leave coils inside, so you have to put an occlusive device, as you can see out here. But not everybody is a good candidate for occlusive devices, and particularly when you have very small babies. As you can see this particular example, there's a, a PDA that is that's an occlusive device that is sticking into the descending into the isthmic region and producing a turbulence. And this is something that you have to be very careful about. You need to plan your sizing very carefully. So if you anticipate that your device is actually going to stick out into the aorta in this fashion and produce a coarctation, you have to consider either sending this patient to surgery or look at alternative ways of addressing it, use an alternative device in this particular situation. So this is something that you have to avoid, and this happens in very small infants, very not very com uncommonly. So the important things that you need to consider before PDA closure is age, how young the patient is, the weight, the maturity, and then comorbidities. All these are important patient characteristics in addition to the anatomy that you need to consider. And what do you have to close? You have coils that I talked to you about. I showed you an example. You have the classic amplage duct occluder 1 and its equivalents. You have the ADO2 that we don't very much use for PDAs now. Exceptional circumstances do exist, but by and large, we don't use it. Then you have the ADO2 additional size that is very useful for preterms. And then you have AVP2, which is basically vascular plug 2 that is useful for very long tubular ducts. So you, this is the armamentarium that we have. And coils are suited when there is a very relatively small duct, 3 mm, and a good ampulla is a must. It's technically challenging, but it's very cheap, and we've had excellent results. Needs a little bit of expertise, but it's really rewarding. These are examples of Gyan Terco free coils, which are very inexpensive. Each coil costs about 5,000 rupees, and typically you're able to close most ducts with two coils. This is a PFM coil, which is ridiculously expensive and does exactly the same thing that these small coils do, so we don't use them, but it is costing a little more than what devices cost. And the technique that we have devised entirely here in Amrita uh, is the way we take three or four coils, suture them together with proline, hold them through a, with a bioptome that has been passed through a short sheath, and then this becomes a very useful coil mass and your clue ducts the way I've showed you, and you get the same results as devices, provided there is ampulla. And this is what have we have been using. Even now we use them in selected circumstances. But occlusive devices have made life very easy. This is the classic ADO1, and you have equivalents of it that you all are very familiar with. This is the ADO2, which has retention discs that are quite large, twice the size of the central waist. ADO2 additional size has smaller, uh, smaller retention discs that allows closure of preterm ducts, and we use it a lot. AVP1 has been abandoned, mostly AVP2 used for long tubular duct, and AVP4, highly selected circumstances, we use for tubular ducts, but essentially those ducts can be coiled. So essentially here is what we have for ADO1. We use a PDA size that is plus two. So if you have a pulmonary artery end that is 4 mm, then we use, should use at least an H6 device or 6 mm at PA end, 8 mm at aortic end, that's the minimum. Uh, and it's suitable ideally for more than 4 to 5 kilos, and we've actually done quite a few uh, less than 3 kilos as well, but we are very careful about case selection. There's a large series that's got published with 6 kilos or under multi-institutional data on ADO1, and obviously very good. Important to realize that 
you use a six french delivery system in most circumstances lifetech pda device allows a smaller delivery system than amplarts because it doesn't have fibers sticking out and allows us to use 68 for even as large a um, 6f for even as large a device as 108 in many circumstances ADO2 additional size is meant for free terms and the really small babies 3 mm pda or less if you have the pda that are more than 3 mm this could embolize you can deliver it through a four french delivery system and it is made life very easy avp2 is for tubular ducts here you need to have a avp2 the diameter of the device has to be twice that of the uh, diameter of the pda anything less than that the duct will embolize the device will embolize and it's a real risk so you have to be very careful with avp2 and remember that avp2 elongates so a 6 mm uh, 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 a 6 mm device if you put it into a 3 mm duct it will become longer so you have to anticipate that elongation and you preferably use it for really long tubular ducts so these are our three things that we most commonly use in 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 pda closures just an example uh, of a few circumstances and this is our publication that was published in journal of american college of cardiology on preterm infants this is the world's first large series on really small babies where we use coils and we chose essentially symptomatic neonates who had failed medical therapy and echo criteria echo criteria were based on ampulla size of the uh, weight of the patient and the narrow duct diameter so a lot of careful case selection you can get really lovely images and you can anticipate how your coil is going to sit you can measure the duct size you can look at all the details in pre terms with high high frequency transducer remember that in these patients you have a very low diastolic gradient suggestive of an a very large duct in this situation the peak systolic gradient can be impressive but that doesn't mean much the procedure itself involves a very specific level uh, steps that are very important the important attention to detail has to be paid um, general anesthesia is what we used in some patients but we've also done it in conscious sedation important to keep the baby warm use warm saline flushes very important to get your access with a 24 gauge cannula a ptca wire a micropuncture cannula after that and a four french sheath we never put an arterial sheath in these patients um occasionally we have arterial lines that we retain once you get important not to manipulate your catheter inside the heart at all so you get your right coronary catheter to the uh, ra rv junction around the tricuspid valve or just close to that and you put your o2 5 thermo right across and to find its way into the pda very easy it happens every single time and this way you avoid manipulating this catheter inside this tender heart and you can perforate if you do that so you have to be very careful get your wire through then over the wire you can take everything once you have done that you exchange this wire for a sheath a four french cook sheath is very useful in this circumstances you place it across the ampulla the rail tube marks out usually the location of the ampulla and you can inject from the side arm with that you get a very nice picture outlining gives you a road map and you can plan your procedure completely either you put your coils or you want to put your ado2 it's very easily done this way so you get these pictures in two views i'm just going to go back and show you because the angiogram started to play here so you can see this angiogram that it uh, demonstrates out here very nicely you can get these pictures and very small volumes of contrast is enough in these circumstances you can get them in two orthogonal views and then through the same delivery system you can take this coil mass in this particular case two coils uh, you need to be a little gutsy to do it but it, we've been able to do this quite nicely in these circumstances and and close these ducts today we prefer this device it's easier and a lot safer uh then coils but it is more expensive so if you have a really patient with patient with economic challenges we still put coils but as far as possible we have moved to this particular device which is the ado2 additional size it has a central waste and two retention discs that are marginally larger not as large as the ado1 so it doesn't stick out very much 
It's a very fine, low profile device that doesn't have any fabric. It's made of nitinol. And for a four, it comes in three sizes, three, four, and five mm in diameters and various lengths. Lengths could be two, three, and four millimeters long. And the retention discs are typically one to 1.25 centimeters, uh, millimeters larger than the disc. So this allows a very easy, low profile passage through a four French delivery system, and it enables very good uh, control over the whole process. So this is the patient, same sheet that we have put in the descending thoracic aorta. And then through this descending thoracic aorta, we pass the, the, the device into the sheet. This is the device. And then we I'm not, these angiograms are not working, unfortunately, at this point. They were working earlier. But then you basically peel back on the sheath, and this nicely deploys the system. Once you have deployed it, you can do a check and echocardiogram, because you don't have arterial access. You can do a check echocardiogram and confirm the fact that you have occluded it, and the left pulmonary artery and the right pulmonary artery are patent. Nothing much is sticking out into the pulmonary artery. You can also look at the aorta. And if everything looks good, you can release the device. And this allows you a very good uh, uh, kind of uh, control over the whole situation and good assessment without actually having to do a arterial access. So we published this data, and this was the first eight patients that we did. Subsequently, we have done several patients, but recognize that we have done children as babies as small as 900 grams. The smallest I've done is 900 grams. At that point, it was the smallest baby ever intervened upon. Uh, and this has really allowed us to, this particular child had a platelet count of 6,000. The surgeons were hesitant to operate it. And we were able to coil the baby and send the baby home. Uh, similarly, we were able to do quite a few other cases. And in this particular series, we did not have any problems. Subsequently, we've done several with ADO2 additional size. We've had one embolization with ADO2 additional size, where we overestimated the, underestimated the size of the duct. Uh, and this had to be retrieved surgically, and the patient had to be operated upon. Patient did well, but this is something that you have to be very careful about. You shouldn't be too ambitious. And probably 3 mm is the cutoff, beyond which preterm ducts should not be uh, closed in the cath lab, I think. So to conclude, most PDAs in infants can be closed in the cath lab. I think the essence really is not so much the technique, but very careful case selection, particularly in the small and preterm babies. Thank you. And if there are questions, I can take them now. I thought I'll go through the entire presentation and then look at questions from uh, everybody. Sorry, I had uh, done not, uh, I think, the, I hope that the screen, I think after the third screen, it came through very well. Any questions? Any questions from all of you? Oh, sorry. Oh, very technical. You know, I wouldn't have related to so much of what this is about. But essentially, uh, we have a fairly large, at one point, we have the world's largest experience on TV cases. With three terms also, we have a very unique experience, which I thought we'd share. But maybe in the natural concrete, I mean, there's a huge part of the three hours that keeps going on there, and I'm concerned about the other hours. Should you close it up or not? This is obviously where you make the decisions that are needed. So we leave it to the neonatologist. We don't make the decisions. We ask, wait for the neonatologist to tell us, okay, we have tried everything. We have given simplemethacin, paracetamol, simplemethacin, and we want you to close this up. So then we, our bias is heavily towards surgery because uh, that's very safe. Actually, contrary to what people think, it's safer than cancer. It's more invasive, but safer because you can guarantee closure. It's where you need to consider a cap closure is in few specific circumstances. One is if you have significant lung issues. 
So doing a thoracotomy in the face of those lung issues, let's say you have a significant amount of right lung pathology, and you do a left thoracotomy with a right lung pathology, child can have significant DQ mismatch. So those circumstances are biased a little more towards exploring cancer. Of course, you have to have anatomic substrate. You, just, you cannot close every duct in the cavity. 3 mm, good ampulla, yes. Otherwise, it's kind of challenging. You have to be careful. It's technically demanding. So, our bias is towards surgery. We have done many more surgeries than, than catheter closure. We have done probably 25 catheter closures in three terms. We must have done about 50 or 60 ducts in the two surgeries. So, we recommend. Surgery as a primary modality, but that under exceptional circumstances. Another situation is when you have very low platelet counts, then cat is safer than surgery. This has a we need a venous access, that's all. So that was the reason to do one or two patients. Occasionally, patient preference and family preference didn't want surgery, but you know that's something which is uh, which can be worked on by talking to them. Uh, but I much as I have done three term ducts, I think the, the surgery works really well. We have, you must have seen the results. If they can, the big advantage is surgery is you can do it at the bedside. With the cath lab, there are people who are trying to pursue PDA closures at bedside, but it's not safe. Because the imaging is not good. Imaging with echo for PDA device closure is not as good as fluoroscopy because you get a whole, the fluoroscopy gives you the whole picture. Echo has to get the exact plane, then only you get the picture. So people are trying to echo on the website, but I, I think we are not there yet. So these are all this is how you compare with reality. These are, I think, exceptional patients. I think that the I completely understand the controversy of whether, you know, many dust probably don't need to be addressed very aggressively. Still, plus minus. Sometimes we really do need to do that. I don't seem to have many more questions from the uh, people who attended the program. Uh, 